Good evening. <laughs> Welcome. It's so nice to hear the buzz and, and so glad you're here. If you are just visiting First Plymouth, a special welcome to you. Um, so, friends, in the church, we're in the 40 days of Lent, which becomes a special time for study and discipline. This year at First Plymouth, we've been using Dietrich Bonhoeffer as a faith exemplar. We have about 25 small groups studying some of his writings and having meetings about those. We've been having sermon series. We help sponsor uh, a showing of Nancy Shanks and Tim Shaw's wonderful play. Um, but, but think with me. We're not just engaging in pure hagiography or just lionizing Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Any historical figure is complex, but we're trying to look at some of the deep spiritual and theological themes that his life represents. I am so glad you're here, and I'm especially glad to be introducing Dr. Victoria Barnett. So listen to this. She has served as the Director of Program on Ethics, Religion, and the Holocaust at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum from 2004 to 2019. She has also been one of the general editors of the multi-volume Dietrich Bonhoeffer Works in the English edition. She is the author of For the Soul of the People, Protestant Protest Against Hitler, also Bystanders, Conscience and Complicity During the Holocaust, and after 10 years, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Our Times. It is a special joy to have a deep expert on Dietrich Bonhoeffer here tonight. Let's welcome Dr. Victoria Barnett. Thank you so very much. Can you hear me all right? I guess they turned this on. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be in a room of people <laughs> as opposed to seeing faces on a Zoom screen. This is the first time in two years I've been able to do this. Um, so it's a special pleasure to be here and I want to first of all thank um, Reverend Keck and Addie Fortherms of uh, Plymouth UCC for the hospitality and for the invitation to be with you tonight. You're here um, because you want to hear about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and the members of this church have been studying Bonhoeffer throughout Lent, and our topic tonight is on moral courage, which is a likely topic if you're talking about Bonhoeffer. Uh, Bonhoeffer has certainly become one of the iconic figures in the 20th century with regard to that phrase, moral courage. He was an early critic of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, he was a supporter of the Confessing Church, which fought against the Nazification of German Protestantism, and a man whose own path throughout the 1930s led him ultimately into the resistance and to the execution at the age of 39, only three weeks before the defeat of Nazi Germany. There are many dramatic moments in his life when we could highlight this issue of moral courage, this evening, I wanted to focus on a period that is often overlooked. In the mid-1930s, his return from England to Nazi Germany in the spring of 1935 and the two years that followed. From 1935 to 1937, Bonhoeffer taught a total of 113 seminarians at Finkenwalde, a village in the remote countryside in the eastern part of Germany. The seminary was closed by the Gestapo in August of 1937. After that, they continued, but they had to go underground and meet in, in secret. But the seminary activities continued, and about 67 candidates went through that period of the seminary. In many ways, it was a deceptively quiet period of Bonhoeffer's life, the calm before the storm, if you will, in terms of his resistance. But over the years, I've gotten more and more convinced that it really was a decisive turning point for him. And that's what I'd like to talk about this evening. So this evening, I'll give a little bit of historical background about this time in his life, and then offer three lessons that I think we can take um, from this period for our reflection when we think about moral courage. So the history. The Nazis came to power in January of 1933, Nine months later, in September of 1933, Dietrich Bonhoeffer left Nazi Germany to go to London. 
He was alarmed by what he saw unfolding in his country and already frustrated and angry about the cowardice of his own church. He was also trying to find his bearings, I think, and figure out what to do. In a letter from London, he wrote to the famous theologian Karl Barth and talked about going into the wilderness for a while to figure, th figure things out. He was only 26 years old. We forget how young he was. At the and he was at the very beginning of his career. And after years of political instability, his country had just undergone a profound change. No one knew where this was going to lead, but there didn't seem to be any place for him in this new Germany or in his church. And the reason for that was that there was a powerful pro-Nazi faction in the German Protestant church that called itself the German Christian Faith Movement. It was extremely anti-Semitic, it was nationalist, and it wanted a Nazified church. That is, it wanted to align the Protestant church not just with the Nazi state, but actually with its ideology. And so the German Christians begin to revise hymns and liturgies and theology itself. By, December, by September of 1933, one third of the Protestant pastorate in Germany, 6,000 clergy members from regional churches throughout Germany had joined this movement. The German Protestant church was arguably the most significant and influential institution in Germany at that time. Two thirds of the German population belonged to this church. This was the church that came out of the Reformation, predominantly Lutheran, but not only Lutheran. It also included a united church tradition that merged Lutheranism and Reformed theology. And in fact, when Bonhoeffer was ordained, he was ordained not as a Lutheran, but as a united pastor. Um, he was a pastor in the old Prussian Union Church, which is the parent church of the United Church of Christ in this country. But with two thirds of the German population as members, and given the international reputation at that time of German theology, to have a highly active pro-Nazi movement within that institution was earth shaking. And by the summer of 1933, Adolf Hitler was using this for everything it was worth because to have the backing of that institution for his regime and its policies gave him a kind of instant legitimacy among the population. If the church supports this new regime, well, then it must be all right. And that meant something internationally as well. In the summer of 1933, there was already an opposition movement growing against the German Christians. And Bonhoeffer, of course, was part of that. This would become the Confessing Church in 1934. But there was also a sizable number of church members and leaders who decided that the best way to navigate all this was to be super careful and keep their heads down. Don't antagonize the Nazi state. Don't antagonize the German Christians. Don't let the church fall apart. Let's keep everyone together and find some kind of common ground, whatever the cost. The leaders of the German Protestant church did not want a schism. And so they made a lot of compromises, both internally with the German Christians and externally with the Nazi state. And that was why Bonhoeffer left Germany. But he went to London to serve two German-speaking congregations, and he didn't leave the German Protestant church. These congregations were part of that church, and he was still salaried clergy within the German church, answerable to his church superiors in Berlin. His situation was very complex, and to sort of get a glimpse of what things were like in that early period, people were still trying to figure out what they supported, what they didn't support, whether they could be party members, they liked some things about it, they didn't like other things. And so he had parish members in London who were Nazi party members. He was one of four pastors in London, one of whom was a Nazi party member. There were clergy in the confessing church who joined the Nazi party. They were against the German Christians, but they, they supported some parts of the government. And there were members of the extended Bonhoeffer family who were Nazi party members. So we need to remember that throughout this period, there are a lot of gray zones and not many clear lines. The confessing church opposed the Nazification of the church, and it didn't want the Nazi state to take over the church governance. Its famous motto was, let the church be the church. But that still left room for nationalism and anti-Semitism and support for various Nazi policies and conformity to Nazi law. Excuse me. 
And all of that is important to understand. When we look at Bonhoeffer and his return to Nazi Germany in April of 1935, even within the Confessing Church, there was division and varying degrees of support for the regime. And by 1935, those divisions had deepened. There was a radical wing of the Confessing Church that wanted nothing to do with the church leadership or with the German Christians, which now included, the church leadership now included diehard German Christians. Most of the theological seminaries in Germany at that point, as well as the official ordination boards that examined and ordained Protestant clergy were controlled by German Christians, which meant that they could weed out clergy who were going to be critical or problematic, excuse me. <coughs> in response, the radical wing of the Confessing Church decided to set up its own governance system, its own seminaries to train clergy, and its own churches. They never broke entirely away from the official church because of these fears of a schism. And so the situation of the congregational system got very, very messy. But that's why Bonhoeffer came back from England. He was going to direct one of these seminaries. There were five of them. They were illegal under church law, but not yet under Nazi law. That would change in August of 1937. Nazi Germany in the spring of 1935 was a very different place than the one that Bonhoeffer had left. The regime had strengthened its hold on every level of German society. The Nazification of Germany was an incremental progress process by which people gradually conformed. You, of course, had supporters from the very beginning, but there were an awful lot of people who were uneasy, uncertain, very torn, and yet, as time went on, they began to find their way forward because this was their, their new government. What else could they do? That meant that if you were not Jewish, if you were not a political leftist or a journalist, that is, if you were not an obvious target of Nazi policies, all you had to do was to obey the new laws and go about your business. Keep your head down, stay out of trouble. And that's exactly what happened. And it also happened in the church. Um, I wrote a book some years ago on so-called bystanders. Are you hearing me all right? I'm feeling kind of an echo. Okay, I got a thumbs up, thank you. Um, and in that book, I wrote that the word bystander is better understood as a verb than a noun. It refers to the process by which people conform, adjust, make compromise. It's an incremental process. And it's the same process by which they ultimately become complicit in things that are much worse. Few Germans started out in 1933 as cold-blooded murderers, but there were quite a few who ended up that way. One overlooked aspect of Bonhoeffer's theology, and I would especially refer you to his letters and papers from prison, is that he witnesses and documents this process in his church and reflects on it theologically. It's almost the only theological reflection we have of that kind. But that was the setting for his two years in Finkenwalde from 1935 to 37. And it's the context for understanding how and why he tried not only to teach his students how to be ministers, but he wanted to mentor them in a way that would give them some courage and some backbone in this new system. And I think in the process, he was also building his own foundation for what was to come. Almost done with the history lesson, who were these seminarians who came to Finkenwalde? They were all men. I say that because there were also women in the confessing church. The first generation of German women were fighting for their ordination during the 1930s, and many of them found their way into the confessing church. They were not in Finkenwalde. Bonhoeffer wanted only men. And when you look at the Bonhoeffer works, there's almost, there's no reference at all to what they were doing. There were men in the confessing church who stood up for these women, but Bonhoeffer was not one of them. So something to keep in mind of the large spectrum of the confessing church and where we see Bonhoeffer and where we don't. But wherever they were, men or women, the seminarians who decided to attend one of these illegal seminarians had already really taken a courageous leap because they had decided not to follow the legally approved path to ordination within the official church. That meant that they were on their own. In the German church, you study, you take ordination exams, your bishop ordains you, and then you're assigned to a, point, a parish. That makes you a civil servant with a great deal of job and financial security. The seminarians at Finkenwalde were there because they had closed off these options. One of them was Bonhoeffer's friend and biographer, Eberhard Bebke, who was at Finkenwalde because he had gotten involved in confessing church meetings and had signed some petitions.
He happened to be in a region with a bishop who was very pro-Nazi. And one day the bishop called him in and said, if you think you want to be a minister, you're going to have to go somewhere else because I won't ordain you. And that's how Beitke ended up at Fink and Valda. These seminarians faced other challenges as well. By the, 19, or the, by the spring of 1935, the Nazi regime had a firm control on the country. And it began to tighten the screws on anyone it thought might give them trouble, which included the more radical members of the confessing church. And these seminaries were particular targets. One month before Bonhoeffer returned from London, over 700 confessing pastors were arrested and briefly imprisoned for reading a protest from their pulpits against the Nazified Christianity of the German Christians. Over the next two years, 27 of Bonhoeffer's Finkenwalde seminarians would themselves end up in prison at some point. When Bonhoeffer himself returned from England in 1935, his own church supervisor in Berlin, the bishop who saw the overseas parishes, contacted the Gestapo that they should keep an eye on Bonhoeffer because he wasn't politically reliable. So although Bonhoeffer didn't know it at the time, he was already being watched. So Bonhoeffer knew that he was training a group of seminarians for the ministry in a very dangerous situation with no one in sight and not knowing where things were going to lead. And this was 1935. The Nazi state was in complete control. It wasn't going anywhere. So, 1935, Bonhoeffer is training seminarians to be ministers in a church in a totalitarian state um, who might be spending their entire careers in that situation. So how do you do that? The historian Clemens von Klemper once described Nazi Germany as a consensual dictatorship. That is, it was indeed a dictatorship. This was a police state, and there was a realistic fear of what might happen if you crossed certain lines. But Hitler enjoyed tremendous popularity among the population in the early years. And there was a lot of collaboration on all levels of the regime. From the research that's been done on the Gestapo, for example, we know that they didn't really need to send informants out into churches. People came to them and informed on neighbors and colleagues and sometimes even their own family. So how do you train someone for the, for the ministry to minister and build up a church in a situation where you don't know who you can trust? How do you train them to be courageous but careful? How do you train them to be true to their deepest values and not betray their own integrity? How do you train someone to preach, to work with youth, to offer counseling, to help strangers who come to, to you for help? in a police state, and not just a police state, but one where there's active buy-in from most of the population. In other words, what's the recipe for moral courage? How do you build it? How do you teach it? How do you in encourage the practices to keep it alive? How do you do that in community, and how do you do it when you're on your own? Um, what does it mean to commit to a course over the long term? when you don't know where things are going and you don't know how they will end? And what does it mean to model that kind of faith for others? Three insights from Bonhoeffer's time at Fink and Valda. Now we're getting to them. Discipleship, community, and being aware of our place in history and our responsibility for the future. First point, discipleship. This was the period during which he wrote his book on discipleship. He dedicated it to his students. If you have read this book, you know that it sets a very high bar for what it means to be a Christian. This is the book where he says, when Christ calls a man, he calls him to come and die. This is the book where he talks about sheep grace, the kind of grace that we kind of build for ourselves that makes us feel good when we go to church, but we leave untroubled and unworried about larger things chief grace and costly grace, where we heed and hear the call of scripture, allow ourselves to be challenged, which leads us down a very different path. In prison, he later acknowledged that he saw the problems with that book, but that he stood by it. There's some debate about what he meant by that. I think that what he meant was that he understood that that book lends itself to a very rigid understanding of what it means to be Christian, 
and reduces Christian faith and discipleship to a set of strict rules that everyone has to follow. That's not how Bonhoeffer understood faith. And this is interesting because this goes back to his dissertation in the 1920s. Bonhoeffer, for his entire life, made a distinction between religion and faith. Religion was our all too human construct, our way of finding ways to talk about God, building institutions of worship, you know, the, the human efforts to articulate belief and to reach God, but that's us. Faith is God coming to us for Christians through the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Faith is God coming to us, our encounter with Jesus and our willingness to follow. That's what discipleship meant for Bonhoeffer. And so for Bonhoeffer, faith was simply a matter of following in the footsteps of Jesus of Nazareth, based on the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the core of that book. There's a wonderful sermon from 1928, right at the beginning of his ministry, where he uh, preached on Psalm 62, verse 2. My soul is silent before God who helps me. Bonhoeffer wrote that, and I quote, modern people have not only lost sight of God, but have lost the very capacity to understand faith. In so doing, human beings lose sight of who we are. When you lose the capacity for faith, he continued, in his words, inwardly you become empty, a plaything of events, a leaf before the wind, driven to and fro and blown away, you have lost your soul, end of quote. In 1935, Germany's churches were filled with people who had lost their souls. And so in Finkenwalde, he began to build a daily routine that included not just theological training, which is what he was there for, but a set of spiritual disciplines, daily practices like prayer and reflection that helped to center us. He visited various monasteries in England before he returned to Germany, and it's one reason that he wanted to visit Gandhi's community in India. He was seeking models for certain kinds of spiritual formation. In this 1928 sermon, he writes, contact with God must be practiced. We must learn the language of God, laboriously learn that language. We must work so that we too are able to speak with God. Prayer must also be practiced through serious work. Confusing religion with emotional daydreaming is a grievous, fateful error, end of quote. You can't maintain the focus and energy for courage if you don't regularly do the things that nurture it and give you a firm backbone in what you believe. Prayer and reflection, Bible reading, confession and repentance. In 1935, Bonhoeffer understood that his students were not going to be able to be clergy if they were inwardly empty. Point two, community. These are also the years in which he wrote his wonderful book, Life Together. Discipleship is often seen as an individualized path. I think especially in our country where we tend to be individualists. Um, It's something we do on our own. It's something between me and God, between each individual and God. Bonhoeffer understood it as something that can really be fulfilled only in community, in the family of the church. Already in the 1920s, he said, no one can be a Christian alone. You can't be a Christian by sitting in your room, reading the Bible, coming to church once a week, and then, you know, going on and doing your thing. Bonhoeffer believed that in this earthly life, 2,000 some years after Jesus of Nazareth walked the earth, we encounter Christ in each other. And especially when we encounter someone who is a stranger, someone very different from us, we must encounter such people as if they were Christ. We must see Christ in them. That's, he said, how you live as a Christian. And that meant that the entire church was really a community where people encountered Christ took care of one another in joy and sorrow, where they stand, stood together. And so Bonhoeffer trained his seminarians to pray together, to confess their sins to each other, forgive each other, not just sit in chairs in a seminary classroom and take notes, but to engage not just with him, but with one another, 
and not just in Sunday worship, but every day of the week. He also built in time for music and for sports and for long hikes together and for games. And this shouldn't be seen as time off. This wasn't their free time. These were things that they did together because all of these things created a network and a community, sort of a band of people who really knew and understood one another. And this was especially important because of what I was just describing about Nazi Germany in the 1930s. You couldn't trust anyone. People were under surveillance. You had to be careful what you said. Children were told in school that they should report their parents if the parents said something against the regime. So Bonhoeffer knew that once his students entered the ministry, once they left Finkenwalde and they were serving a congregation out in the middle of nowhere, they were going to be very isolated and they needed someone that they could reach out to and absolutely trust. And so he created this network of seminarians who knew that they had each other's backs, who knew that they could call on someone else at any time. After they left Finkenwalde, he would mail them newsletters with Bible studies and updates on what people were doing and always asking them to pray for and to help one another. When one of them, for example, a man named Werner Koch, uh, was involved in a memorandum to Hitler that was leaked to the foreign press and was arrested and imprisoned in Sachsenhausen concentration camp for almost two years, Bonhoeffer sent that news around and asked everyone not only to pray, but to check in on Koch's wife and family, to support her financially, to bring food by, to help her however they could. In my first book, I wrote about the Confessing Church, and I, I actually interviewed about 65 people um, who had been members of the Confessing Church. I did these interviews in the 1980s, and I'll never forget one of the women I interviewed was a church youth worker, um, and she told me a story. This was 1937, 36 or 37, and there was growing state pressure on the youth work with the church because the Nazis really had a lot of youth programs for youth. They really wanted to indoctrinate them and get them involved in the movement. And so the Hitler youth meetings, for example, were always scheduled at the same time as the church events. And when young people didn't show up at a, at a Hitler youth meeting, uh, the Gestapo would show up at their family home and challenge the parents and say, I see that your son or daughter wasn't at this meeting. Um, why are you sending them to church? Don't you think they belong at our meetings instead? So she was under immense pressure and she went to her bishop, her, her pastor, and said, I, you know, I don't know what to do. There's no point in what we're doing because we're under such pressure. And the pastor said to her, have you ever been in a German town or a German village with one of these medieval fountains in the center of, of the town? If you've ever been to Germany, you might know what I'm talking about. There are these old fountains from the Middle Ages. Often there's kind of a spring, that, so the water is always running. And she said, yes. And he said, okay, you have to think of yourself like one of these fountains. Every day people are gonna walk past you. <laughs> you know, you're, you're there, but you know, they're, they're not coming to town to go to the fountain. But if they know that they need water, they always know that this fountain is there. And he said, you're like that. He said, you have to keep doing your work. People may ignore you, you may be under pressure, but if they need you, they will know where to find you. And that's what the church in our context must be. In other words, when we see ourselves as a resource, as a community where people can turn for help, as a place where people can feel a solidarity and find comfort, that strengthens something not only in our wider community, but within ourselves. And it gives us a different sense of vocation, of backbone and calling. And that too, I think, is part of the foundation for moral courage. Third point, Bonhoeffer had an uncanny sense of his place in human history. And as a result, he thought a lot from early on about his personal responsibility for the future. And he tried to convey that to his students. He came by this naturally. He was of the generation that grew up during the First World War. Um, many of these young Germans had lost someone in the war. His own older brother died in the war. He also lived through the immediate aftermath of the war, the um, starvation period when people didn't have enough to eat, the you know, the period of political turbulence. So Bonhoeffer knew what it was like to 
be in a situation where you were at the mercy of larger forces. <laughs> you know, your family couldn't just decide that they were going to do something. You know, it was, you were in the middle of a much larger situation. If you think of Ukraine today, um, you know, Ukrainians have no power over what they can do because of that situation. And so Bonhoeffer had experienced that as a young man. He writes a lot about this during the resistance period, but again, it's there in his writings from the very beginning. There's a school paper that he wrote at the age of 16 um, on the Greek tragedian Euripides, which concludes with the following words, and I quote, Euripides was a, a poet of struggling truth. Nothing was more important to him than the truth, and his most distinguished contribution for all times was that he showed this to his people, end of quote. Even at the age of 16, <laughs> Bonhoeffer had this almost eerie sense of a certain responsibility for his country, for his people, for the, for the, the future. Um, and we see this again in 1933 in his message to his own church. He immediately understood the nature of the challenges that National Socialism was going to confront the church with, a challenge to the very essence of what Christians should be about. So when Bonhoeffer arrived in Finkenwalde in 1935, with an awareness that he was going to have to do more than cope, he had to have his eyes on the future, and he had to help his seminarians understand that. There was no way they could know which way where things were going, but they had to know who they were and what they wanted from the future and what kind of people they were going to be no matter what happened. This also gave him a certain wisdom, I think, that the future is in the hands of the next generation. We do our part during our lifetimes, but then at some point it's time to hand it over. And that was his focus in these years, educating this group of young men, not just for their ministry in the church, but giving them the foundation for whatever would come next. For almost all of them, that meant the war. The vast majority of confessing church seminarians and clergy were drafted into Hitler's army. Some 2,000 died on the front, and almost all of Bonhoeffer's seminarians were sent to the Eastern Front in 1939. Of the 113 candidates who were, went through Finkenwalde, 32 died in action. And the reality, of course, is that some of them were also in units that committed atrocities. And this, too, is part of the Bonhoeffer story that he reflects on deeply once he gets to prison. This was true of the resistance circles in which he moved. We can't understand Bonhoeffer's wartime writings on ethics, on guilt, without recognizing the complexities of the times in which good people found themselves in highly charged and complex situations. And that brings me to some concluding thoughts. It is understandable when we turn to the example of Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, to think of moral courage. But if we think of moral courage only in terms of heroic deeds or one-time events that go down in the history books, I think we miss something. And I think we miss something in Bonhoeffer's own theology. In his own life, he was relatively unknown. He was a young man just starting his career. He wasn't a bishop or a leading theologian. Uh, he was kind of a troublemaker. <laughs> he left Germany a lot, and he was on the losing side of some major battles within the church. Uh, when I was doing these interviews on the Confessing Church in the 1980s, um, Bonhoeffer was the name I knew, and so I always asked people, did you know Dietrich Bonhoeffer? And several people said to me, you know, we never heard of him until after 1945. You know, we see him now as the major figure. In his own lifetime, he was not. And I think it's important to remember that when we read him. And he ended his life, I think, to some extent with a sense of failure. Um, he did not live to see the defeat of National Socialism. He had a sense of failure about what had happened to Germany and what had happened to his church. That haunting passage in his essay called After Ten Years we have been silent witnesses of evil deeds, are we still of any use, is, I think, a personal confession. But it's followed by a remarkable reflection that he titles The View from Below, and I will read it to you. We have for once learned to see the great events of world history from below, 
from the perspective of the outcasts, the suspects, the maltreated, the powerless, the oppressed and reviled, in short, from the perspective of the suffering." End of quote. Bonhoeffer was anti-Nazi from the very beginning, but that's a different thing than standing with the victims of history. I don't think he was there in 1933, but I think he got there by the 1940s. And my reading is that Bonhoeffer began to understand that toward the end of his life, when he himself had become vulnerable, the path of discipleship led him to this view from below. Bonhoeffer's theology, what he leaves us with, is among other things a long reflection on what it means to travel a lonely path in a time of great evil. His theology helps us think about what that means, and that's what he tried to model for his students at Finkenwalde. And I think it's the insight about moral courage for our times that he may offer. Moral courage is something else besides just activism or responding to something in the moment. For Bonhoeffer, it was based on a sense of responsibility to others, to the victims, and to future generations. In 1942, Bonhoeffer wrote a wonderful letter to a younger colleague with words that could have been written to us today. And I quote, there is a common ground, a common task, a common hope, indeed something that transcends the gap between generations. When we ponder this, then our own short personal life becomes relatively insignificant. We begin to think about greater periods of time and greater tasks. Right now, you belong to a community that in any case is actively living through one of the great turning points of history. You yourself can do hardly anything about the broad course of events. You probably think, feel utterly unnecessary, out of place, with all sorts of personal worry and struggle. So what other wish should I have for you today than that you learn not to take these small personal things, desires and hardships too seriously, but rather to understand yourself in your place and within the possibilities given to you as a link in the long procession of generations who have worked and lived for a beautiful, authentic, and devout Germany and still do so." End of quote. Moral courage is placing ourselves intentionally in that larger historical project that bends toward justice in our place, in our own time, and within our possibilities. Those few years that Bonhoeffer spent training these young men for the ministry was only part of his much longer path. But I think that this was the period in which he discovered what he, what he had to offer and who he was and prepared himself for whatever was to come. Thank you so much for your kind attention this evening and for attending. Thank you.